Thank you, Skip. I am truly honored to have the opportunity to introduce my dear friend, colleague, and mentor, Dr. Ann Streety Wimberly, um, who is the professor of Christian education at the Interdenominational Theological School in Atlanta Emeritus. And she is also the director of the Youth Hope Builders Academy, uh, which is a youth theological program that is designed to encourage young people to um, explore theological themes, to explore uh, their faith deeper, uh, to begin thinking about what their vocation might be in um, whether it be education, whether it be theology, or moving on to other disciplines. Dr. Wimberly um, has been called Dr. Ann by some of her students and by the youth that she works with, Grandma Ann, which she cherishes from the depth of her heart. She uh, has a bachelor's degree, uh, in, a bachelor of science degree in um, education from Ohio State University, as well as a master's degree in music from Boston University, which, where she also undertook doctoral studies uh, in music and educational foundations. She holds a master of theology uh, degree from Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, where she began the, the initial work on her book, Soul Stories, her best-selling book, one of her best-selling books, uh, Soul Stories. Um, and she also did her PhD work in um, education as well as gerontology from Georgia State University. Dr. Wimberly did some postdoctoral work at Claremont School of Theology in its Institute of Religion and Wholeness, now called the Klein Bell Center. I am truly honored to introduce Dr. Wimberly. She is not only a renowned scholar who has published over a dozen books and probably countless articles, um, but she is also a fantastic teacher one who was engaging, one who was thorough, one who was well-read, and her work is well-researched. I taught a course this past semester um, titled Christian Education in the African American Experience, and we used two of Dr. Wimberly's books, Soul Stories as well as um, Christian Education, uh, Nurturing Faith and Hope, Christian Education, uh, Worship as a Foundation for Christian Education, Black Worship as a Foundation for Christian Education, and we read some, several of her articles. So that tells you how much I appreciate her work and her scholarship. I'm also very honored and excited to say that if you want to learn more about Dr. Wimberly, I have just completed two articles on her. One, a very short piece that is uh, just coming out in the Encyclopedia of Christian Education. It's just barely on the market. I just got the notice this week, and there's a very short bio in there of her life but then a more extended piece on Dr. Wimberly um, on the database called Christian Education, Christian Educators of the 20th Century. And it's out by Talbot um, Theological Seminary. So I encourage you to learn as much as you can about this wonderful person, this wonderful scholar, teacher, friend, and mentor. I love you, Anne. We're, we're happy to have you and welcome. It is a joy and an honor to be here with you here at YDS that I call home as well. As I prepared for today, I thought, well, my beginning question really is, can we talk? <laughs> and as I continued to prepare, I thought, well, if we are going to talk, there's an awful lot I want to say. And I know that I must say it in a limited period of time, but it's a lot. So I'm just going to ask you to hold on and hang in here as we talk together about disconnected youth. And I want to do it face to face. So I want to see you, and I invite you to hear me. Shall we begin? This lecture 
is intended to present some very early preliminary data collected from the research project entitled Building Bridges of Hope, the church's role in reaching disconnected black youth. The lecture will highlight data collected from a purposive sample of 51 black youth ages 13 to 18 from Atlanta, Georgia, Houston, Texas, and Richmond, California. These data will serve as a benchmark for further waves of data collection across the four geographic regions of the U.S. These preliminary outcomes reflect the project's focus on uncovering profiles of disconnected black youth, often called unchurched youth. Emphasis centers on the extent, nature of, and reasons for black youth's disconnection from church, their attitudes toward church, and suggestions for positive church connections with them. Supported by the Lilly Endowment Incorporated, the research effort is sponsored by the Youth Hope Builders Academy of Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta and is being carried out by research team members, including myself as principal investigator and co-researchers, Minister Pamela Perkins, the YHBA program coordinator, Dr. Casina Washington, YHBA program associate, and Minister Sarah Farmer, YHBA program associate, in addition to four ethnographers located across the four geographic regions of the U.S and evaluator statistician, Dr. Sandra Barnes at Vanderbilt University. The project responds to an awareness of increasing numbers of black youth who have little or no church affiliation, and to the scant empirical research that documents who these youth are and what precisely constitutes their disconnection. At the same time, we are guided by definitions of disconnected or unchurched youth provided by Lenitria Fix and Jeffrey Wallace and by George Barnes and David Kinneman's definition of unchurched adults. You may look at the handout on your tables. The Fix and Wallace highlight three distinct groups in their definition. Unchurched youth, or the purely unchurched, are those outside church who never attended. De-churched youth are those who had previously attended but ceased attending. Non-church youth, or the minimally churched, are those attending church unpredictably or infrequently, that is, no more than one or two times a month. The non-churched are also youth who are in the periphery of church life in that they are not part of any church group or activities. Importantly, the church, the research effort, and what I present here responds to the need to take seriously the voices of black youth, to hear them out, rather than to rely on what adults say about them. Actually, empirical data do not exist on these teens' views about the role of the church in their everyday lives. What we do know is that studies indicate both the invisibility and muteness of black youth. The lack of scholarship focused on their views mirrors the lack of attention that both larger society and faith communities give them. In an effort to see and hear them, the study reaches out to youth in boys and girls clubs, athletic clubs, inner city neighborhoods, charter schools, and school organizations across the geographic regions of the U.S. Before presenting the data, I want to digress, however, for a few minutes as means of placing the current concerns for disconnected black youth in historical perspective. My purpose in doing so is to draw attention to the historical role of the black church as an institution addressing not simply the spiritual lives of black people, but complex issues faced in everyday life. The historical perspective is also to provide some clues to the question, how did we get where we are? How did we get in the present situ situation of disconnected youth? Now, Hear this. 
the historical black church from the era of black enslavement forward is known for its functioning as a village or a tribal organization, to use the words of W.E.B. Du Bois in 1899. Over time, the black church has been re recognized as both a religious and social institution, a culture-specific place for young people's spiritual formation, educational betterment, recreational expression, social uplift, political awareness, and occupational preparedness toward the end of economic sufficiency. In 1941, the poet Richard Wright said, our churches are where we dip our tired bodies in cool springs of hope, where we retain our wholeness and humanity. At the same time, in the throes of the great migration of black people from the South to Northern cities that came into swing in and following the First World War, Wright recognized the struggle of churches to make good on this indispensable role. He admonished churches in the North to get the folk in your churches, make them welcome, don't turn your nose, and let the saloon man and the gambler do all the welcoming. The truth of the matter is that welcoming folk, including youth, was not always easily accomplished. Even in those days, there was increasing awareness by churches north and south, rural and urban, of increasing competing options for the youth's attention and loyalties, and there was the need to respond to use attitudes toward the church. For example, in 1941, hmm, a study of 2,241 presumably church-affiliated black youth in eight southern counties, 50% of the boys and 93.5% of the girls affirmed the statement, the preacher tells you to do a lot of things that he doesn't do himself. <laughs> The youth criticized sermons as being stereotyped and objected to what they perceived as emotional antics. One youth said, I think a preacher out here ought to preach today about things of today. Give the people advice and help them out of their troubles by talking about things that happen today. I don't think a preacher ought to try to preach you into heaven. Does it sound familiar? Hmm. Nonetheless, overall, the participation of youth in church life remained high at that time. And the formation of new churches, including storefront churches in northern cities, responded to religious as well as other needs and expectations. It is well known that the strategic activity of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s was carried out largely by young people to the degree that it is appropriately remembered as a youth movement. This movement, led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., was centered in the black church and was motivated by Christian religious values and a certainty that God wants us free. Historical documents affirm that it was youth who were at the center of sit-ins at lunch counters, kneel-ins at churches, wait-ins at beaches, sleep-ins at motels, and freedom rides across interstate lines. College students, high school students, and elementary school children courageously withstood the punishment meted out in hundreds of cities, towns, and rural communities and continued on in spite of the political indifference emanating from the corridors of power in Washington, D.C. Now, this quote comes from the Charles Johnson book, Youth and the Church, uh, in the Hart Nelson Yokely uh, book, The Black Church in America. So what's new? Something changed. With the assassination of Dr. King, the black freedom movement's leader came grief, discouragement, and despair at being unable to imagine a positive and realizable future that differed from the present. 
in spite of the later passage of civil rights laws and emerging beneficial opportunities and advancement for black people, there remained an uncomfortable reality. Those with beneficial life circumstances and those without continued to share in common, absurd, and demeaning experiences caused by our particular ethnic racial identity in a racially charged society. Moreover, even though there were opportunities for educational advancement, social position, and material gain for increasing numbers of black persons, this situation lay in stark contrast to the failure of life chances and abject poverty for many, many others. Life experienced by many of the black youth moved in terms of its meaninglessness, lovelessness, and hopelessness. Of course, they had questions about faith in life. Not surprisingly, black people, especially the young, raised some critical questions. Why and in whom shall we have faith? How can we count on God who is not good all the time and who does bad things to good people? What hope is there for life? Church? It hasn't worked. It isn't working. Why church then? In the aftermath of the civil rights movement, the discontent of young people in their teens and 20s was captured in the birth of the hip hop generation and hip hop culture, which served as a revolutionary cultural force intended to challenge the status quo. The culture of hip hop evolved from disenfranchised urban youth who felt that they had no support system or resources. This culture is described in Emmett Price's book, The Black Church and Hip Hop Culture, as a supplement or even an alternative to the weekly dose of Sunday morning faith. The views about the church as a viable working entity was further fueled by the difficulty of churches in reaching out to youth, hearing and welcoming them, even as many of our churches found themselves struggling to survive. The reality is that with successive generations, the number of black youth who are disconnected from the church has risen. Indeed, the seminal 1990 work of C. Eric Lincoln and Lawrence Mamiya, The Black Church in the African American Experience, affirms the growing tenuous hold of black churches on segments of the black urban youth and young adult populations. The book urges the black church toward reconnection, particularly with the urban black poor, for the sake of forging a better future for them and the church. This brings me to what I want to emphasize in what's remaining of our time. Lest we forget, the role of the historic black church was to assure that young people both survived and thrived as hope-filled and hope-giving Christians along what oft times seemed unending, difficult circumstances of life. The reassertion of this role is critical today. It is critical given the seeming day-by-day -day replay of heart-rending situations that call forth the desperate cry, I can't breathe, and the forceful declaration, black life matters. But frankly, the situation is tough. I want to suggest today that it is not simply our youth's disconnection with the church that is the problem. Rather, it is the church's disconnection with them. Do we know who they are? How and why they are, were, or cease to be involved in church? Do we know what they think about the church from them? What issues they face and who they go? for help. Some of the preliminary data I will share provide answers to the questions that result from use completion of a survey. Now, the sample. 
As stated before, the survey sample included 51 black teens aged 13 to 18. 27 were from the Atlanta area, 15 were from Richmond, California, nine were from Houston, Texas. The total group included 32 females and 19 males, 29 were ages 17, 18, 12 were aged 15 and 16, and 10 were ages 13 and 14. The teens who completed the survey come from five different urban family structural formations. First, nuclear households accounted for 43.1% of the sample, with blended families, that means stepmoms and dads and stepdads and moms, accounting for nearly half of the nuclear families and 21.5% of the total sample. Second, 22% of the family households were headed by single parents. The third family structure was multi-generational and multi-kin networks. These families comprised close to 18% of the sample. In this regard, the multi-generational homes included three-generation homes where both the teen's grandmother, their mother, and other children reside. They included homes where grandparents, both parents, and children reside. They included homes where a grandparent, an uncle, and children reside. And they included what's called a skip generation home, where the teens reside with the grandmother in the absence of the parents, as well as homes headed by an aunt or ones where the parent, uncle, and children reside. Fourth, five 18-year-old college students, 9.8% of the sample, lived on campus. Fifth, the college student, one college student lived in an apartment and one teen resided in a group home. The diversity of family structure reflects overall 21st century trends, but it also points to how black people create workable family ties that their particular situations demand especially the doubling up of generations and kin in households for economic reasons. So why disconnect? The survey data show variations in the church involvement of the youth. Slightly more than 40% were previously involved in church worship and or other parts of church life, but stopped. These youth constitute what may be called, remember, de-churched youth. They give many reasons for their disconnection. These reasons fall into five categories. First, about a third of them stopped because they said they're distracted, busy with other things, lack motivation, or simply have no reason. These youth said, for example, I'm just not motivated to go to anybody's church. Or as others said, I don't wake up in time and nobody wakes me up, <laughs> or there's really no good reason, or I don't know why, I just don't go. Other responses in this category pointed to work schedules, sports, or other conflicting events, or simply other things to do. The 18-year-old college students were more likely to identify distractions of various kinds as the reason for their disconnectedness. A second reason youth gave for stopping their church participation is the influence of family and friends. A number of them said that they were previously involved because of their grandparents and that they had stopped because either they no longer reside with a grandparent or the grandparent died. Others stopped going when their parents divorced. In one case, when the parents divorced, the teen was placed in the mother's custody and said, my mom's always tired. I don't know where my dad is. In another case, the youth said, my mom's on dialysis and can't drive much. Whereas in other cases, the response was that they don't go to church because a girlfriend or boyfriend don't go. Relocation is a third reason given for youth disconnection. About 15% of the youth had moved from another place to the current location most from another state. 18-year-old college students were among this group. 
Those in college who do not attend church in their current locale tended to say that they go to church when they go home. Younger teens indicated, for example, that it's hard to find a church like the one they previously attended. Some of these youth told of visiting churches, in fact, but of finding none of them satisfactory. Church-related or theological concerns constitute a fourth reason for you stopping church participation. References to the church as boring, messy, or being focused on money were typical responses. 15% of the total group completing the survey indicated these three answers. One of the youth, a 16-year-old, indicated that he was previously involved in church worship but was never convinced that there is a God. He said, I only believe and still currently believe that through self-enlightenment we can grow and truly understand things. A fifth reason is transportation. About 5% of the youth said that they stopped going to church because they have no way to get there and there's no church in close proximity. There were non-churched or minimally church youth in the survey group as well. About 18% indicated that they currently attend church worship one to two times per month with no involvement in other church life activities. An additional 15 plus percent had stopped attending worship at one time, but currently attend once or twice monthly. And a smaller proportion currently attend only on special days like Easter, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Christmas, etc. The infrequent attendance of these youth is what classifies them as non-churched or minimally churched youth. Only a few about 2% of the youth in the first wave of data collection had never attended church. Moreover, those who had never attended gave no reason for being unchurched youth or purely unchurched youth. Now, there was scant mention of teens' connection with other faiths. Only one teen had been previously involved in Christian worship but stopped and is currently involved in a New Age Buddhist community. A second teen, one that I spoke of earlier, partic participated in Christian worship, still does once or twice monthly, but also participates in a Hebrew Israelite community. Interestingly, there were no youth involved in the Islamic faith so far, but we still have more data to collect. Of the sample, close to 12% are frequent church participants. These youth attend church worship three to four times monthly, as well as other activities such as Bible study, youth groups, choir, or other artistic endeavors. In this next section, I pose the question, lean on whom? I want to move to the responses of the youth to survey questions about key life issues they face and where or to whom they go to get help for these issues. As a preface to sharing the responses, I want to call our attention to a song entitled Lean On Me by Bill Withers that was popular some years ago. The message of the song was, lean on me when you're not strong. I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on. If there's a load you have to bear that you can't carry, I'm right up the road. I'll share your load. So call on me, brother. Call on me, sister, when you need a hand. We all need somebody to lean on. It was popular among church folk because the lyrics pointed to the role of the black church as part of the wider extended family on which black people relied for assistance amidst the tough realities of life. The church in particular embraced a theology of God's family and served as an adoptionist community. This meant that God worked through the church family, and especially the pastor as the faith leader was expected to be there for a suffering community and to help persons across the ages and stages address the struggles and crises they confront. 
But in light of black youth's disconnection from church for whatever reason, and even those who are frequent church participants, youth were conflicted in where they got help. And they were least likely, least likely to identify the church as an assistive community. So what were the issues they confronted and who did they identify as sources of social support, mutual aid, or assistance? Prominent issues of the respondents clustered in the areas of personal, family, peer, school, educational, and economic concerns. Personal concerns range from negative assessment of their appearance, self-esteem issues, issues with overall health and wellness, fitness, issues with sexual health and sexuality, self-identified attitudinal problems and self-assessed laziness, suicidal thinking or attempts, stress, inability to express true feelings to loved ones, trust issues, concern for spiritual life, or as one teen put it, simply finding myself or what I should put my efforts into. For some college students, being away from home was an issue. Teens' concerns for family included the health or death of parents or grandparents, custody issues. In four cases, either one or both parents and grandparents had died. And in two cases, a grandparent had cancer. Peer pressure and bullying were among the peer issues raised by teens, in addition to involvement in street life, crime, and violence. They also mentioned loss of peers through murder. Gangs, interestingly, were not mentioned. School or educational concerns focused on grades, failure, poor study habits, and organization of time. Difficulties in making decisions about the future or setting life direction goals. One team mentioned the meanness of school personnel. A few of the youth identified unemployment issues that impinge upon their own or family finances. For college students, unemployment brought about difficulties in obtaining money for college tuition, the need to buy gas for the car, or to pay for a car note. So whom do they seek for help? The responses of many of the youth reveal a startling, troubling pattern of loneliness and insularity. Half, half of the youth indicated that they go to no one with the issues of their lives. They mentioned grappling alone with spiritual life issues or trouble making sense out of life. They sought no one on family issues, such as divorce, custody battles, and absences of fathers. They reach out to no one for help with self-esteem, health issues, bullying, trust issues, finances, school issues, life goals, and death of friends and family members. Particular stories that stuck out for me were of a 13-year-old who told of having an attitude problem and simply said, it helps me to just shut everybody out. And of an 18-year-old college freshman who indicated that he is raising a sibling by himself due to the death of his mother and wasn't consulting anyone. I'm still trying to get my head around how that's possible. This tendency on the part of both males and females calls for action that reverses the trend of loneliness and insularity and calling on no one for help. But the fact that it is more prevalent among the males perhaps highlights needed extra efforts, particularly 
because young black males are more likely the ones who are failing in school, jobless, targeted and killed by police, in the juvenile justice system and detention centers, physically dying from violence, and slowly dying from post-traumatic stress syndrome, health disorders, and substance abuse. Close to 40% of the youth go to family members or friends, including girlfriends or boyfriends, with a host of issues. This finding reflects the ongoing role of the everyday extended family networks in providing what Carol Stack identified in 1974 as protective strategies and stress buffers. Some examples are as follows. A 13-year-old male was dealing with being bullied. He said, when I brought my 19-year-old friend, they stopped messing with me. But I wasn't going to punk out if they tried to fight. A 13-year-old female said that even though I really just talk to myself, sometimes I talk to my mother. From my mother, I've learned to be myself. A 14-year-old female told of going to her grandmother about family issues. She said that her grandmother happens to be heavily involved in church, but she doesn't go. A 15-year-old female mentioned her struggle with sexuality issues and said that it was her dad who talked to her and let her know how to do what's right and what's best for her. A 17-year-old female told of going to friends to deal with self-harm and self-esteem. She said, they helped me through talking it out, I guess. But she added, nothing was really done. Another 17-year-old male told of his issue of being lazy but not trying hard enough for what he knows is best for him and instead getting caught up in the street life. He said that his girlfriend wants him to do better and get out of the streets. An 18-year-old female told of going to her mother and friends about school and life issues while another 18-year-old female went to a sibling about stress, sexual, and health concerns. Two of the youth said that they turned to the school counselor or tutor for help with educational difficulties, but we remember the one that talked about the meanness of school personnel. A few others turned to God or a pastor or seek religious or spiritual answers to issues they face. For example, an 18-year-old female said that she turned to God when trying to decide on her true goals in life. Another 18-year-old told of being able to express her true feelings to God. Two other 18-year-olds indicated that they had gone to a pastor to deal with personal issues. One sought pastoral advice on school and educational issues and the death of both parents, while the other brought concern about health to a pastor. One went to a physician about sexual and health concerns. Two youth indicated they had no issues, or they wouldn't share them in the survey. As part of the survey, the youth were also asked to rate the effectiveness of named people and groups in helping them address issues and problems they face today. Specifically, they were asked, how well do you think these people and groups are helping to address the problems black youth face today. Their choice responses were not sure, not effective, somewhat effective, or very effective. The lists from which they chose included parents, grandparents, and other family members, mentors, gangs, peers, schools, local governments, school, community agencies, churches, and others that the respondents could add. More than half, 53% rated parents and 51 rated grandparents and other family members as being very effective in helping youth address issues and problems they face today. However, it is interesting to note that only 39% of the youth rated the church as being very effective. 35.2% hmm. rated mentors as very effective. 
followed by peers who were rated very effective by close to 30%. Schools and gangs were each rated very effective by 17.6%. Community agencies were rated as very effective by 13.7%. And local government agencies were rated very effective by close to 10%. Close to 10% of the teens added as very effective jobs, sports, books, the self, and drugs. It is important to note that a third of the respondents targeted none of the above, no one as being very effective. The use views of the key effectiveness of parents, grandparents, and other family members in helping them highlight, again, family successes in providing protective mechanisms as well as exemplifying and fostering resilience amidst life stressors. At the same time, there is room for caution in that nearly half of the teens did not target exceptional familial help. The low proportion of youth who viewed the church as very effective is, to say the least, a wake-up call. Would you agree? So, listen up, listen up. The church must lend a helping hand. Having said that, it must not be assumed that the youth have dismissed the black church from its responsibility for their well-being. This reality was made abundantly clear in the responses of teens to the question, how much do you think the church should help address key issues and problems black youth face today? They chose from four measures of extent. Not sure, not at all, some responsibility, and a lot of responsibility to a list of 25 issues. I've included them on your handout, so we'll follow this two together. The following gives attention to items on the list to which the church was given a lot of responsibility by the youth. The percentage of youth assigning great responsibility of the church in helping them deal with the issues appears on the right. And on the left, you see the issues and problems in descending order of importance. Eight issues were targeted by more than half of the teens. Grief, death, sadness, suicide thinking, attempts, spiritual life, substance abuse, drugs, crime, and violence, family issues, school or educational issues, and racism. But I have to tell you, I had a hard time getting past the first three. And every time I look at those three and I call them out, I have a hard time not crying and yelling and screaming. The top three issues or problems, grief, death, and sadness, suicide thinking and attempts, and spiritual life are unprecedented cries for help. These preliminary findings bring to stark awareness that black youth are attuned to, experience, and deeply feel the present-day grief-producing killing of black males at the hands of police. They deeply feel the crisis in race relations. They deeply feel stressors caused by increasing instances of violence and death within and outside the black community. They deeply feel the struggle for personhood and human flourishing that seems in short supply. What is fearfully the case 
is that you see few or no options for reversals amidst difficult realities. Grief becomes unbearable for them, and the answer to the question, survive and thrive, becomes relinquish life and embrace dying? Let me continue. In truth, the high proportion of youth who seek the church's response to thoughts and attempts at suicide is a new phenomenon and must not be taken lightly. Moreover, this wake-up call is affirmed by recent statistics from the Centers for Disease Control showing a sharp rise in suicidal ideation and the suicide rate among black youth. The teens are letting us know that the issue of suicide is real. They are letting us know that they need, they want the churches to listen up, stand up, reach out, connect, and act. It is also notable that teens in the study see something and are reaching for something of great worth through their call for churches to be responsible nurturers of their spiritual lives. Somehow, they see a relationship between suicide attempts and grief. They see a connection, I think, between faith and health, or for a spiritual anchor that can carry them through life's mayhem or make possible the coming of joy in the morning. Why else would they place in that top three spirituality? Through their call, teens are clearly not putting the church down or disclaiming the church's role. To the contrary, they are in essence affirming an historic role of the black church in the lives of the people with their backs up against the wall. Let me continue. Through the eyes of youth, the church's greatest difficulties and strengths. The preliminary data go further by disclosing teens' observations of the black church's greatest difficulty in serving the needs of today's black youth, as well as the church's greatest strengths in serving these youth. The following presents some of these findings, difficulties. An overall assessment of difficulties was that churches fail to help young blacks know that going to church is important. That's what they said. Alongside this view was the assertion of youth that the church lacks effort, appeal, and ability to relate to youth, and that the church often is simply a messy place to be. Teens also highlighted troubling attitudes toward and treatment of others, such as failing to help homeless people, failing to listen, or as one youth put it, Churches only listen to a certain amount of how you feel. They pressure to get along with the program. The teens targeted the churches being hypercritical, judgmental, and making you feel uncomfortable. In the words of one teen, I would say that the church looks at us differently because we don't always wear the right thing or we wear too short dresses and skirts. The teens highlighted the nature of church worship, including its being too long and at inconvenient times, of failing to keep the youth's attention, or of presenting a show to the extent that what is presented is not believable, including offering empty preaching. Recall the earlier study in 1941? Hmm. Question, has anything changed? The youth also targeted programmatic difficulties in the form of the church's failure to reach out to youth where they are in welcoming ways. They said bluntly, there's a communication problem. 
Call it miscommunication or lack of two-way communication that leads to the youth not attending church. The youth highlighted further difficulty in the churches connecting with youth on the real issues they are encountering. Or as one youth said, it's like they don't want to deal with us. They don't want to talk about drugs, dating, grief, etc. At the same time, one respondent said, it's not like the church alone that has the difficulty. Black youth need to speak out about what is going on. Well, I want to say today that surely the teens have spoken out in this preliminary wave of surveys. They have opened up about their difficulties. But they have also recounted some strengths that already exist or might be in church. Some of the teens targeted theological strengths, like the church is presenting the word of God, providing some messages, sermons that resonate with what youth face. They say some churches do that by showing youth how God helps us day by day and by giving a spiritual word that helps people in need and realizing their strength is prayer and doing a good job of asking, job, asking God for help. The youth identified environmental strengths, including the church's appearance and surroundings. One youth said the church's strength gets reflected when it provides a place of comfort and acceptance. In the words of another, I want to say that the church's greatest strength is when we can come to anybody in the church with our problems and we can feel safe. Regarding programmatic strengths, one youth said, the church exercises its greatest strength when it provides what is needed to help you stay out of the streets. One youth pointed to youth programs and activities that are community-based or that take activities to group homes. Another strength comes when churches decide to give youth what they need and not what they want. Now that's a youth talking. The church shows its strength when it does not use a cookie cutter approach. Recently, one youth said there was a riot and they, she was speaking about the riot, I think in Ferguson and uh, in uh, Baltimore and in some other places. The church shows its strength, she said, because we went on a march to say that isn't right, you're making it worse. Teens also said that the strength of the church comes through when members model the faith and mentor by telling us testimonies that let us know that others have been through it and youth can come out strong. Another teen said, there are a lot of people who can be there for youth and are willing to donate their time to help youth. From what they said, the teens also inferred that the church's strength comes from the fulfillment of the church's missional priorities. They stated it in several ways. The church shows its strength when it serves people in need when it gives out book bags and school supplies, for example, when it gives out free food to those who need it, and by providing great resources for us to use. The church shows its strength when it keeps the tradition and makes sure youth keep up with the church's faith. I followed this with another question on behalf of the youth. Do you hear me now? <laughs> in the survey, teens were asked to disclose in a very personal way what they need from the church. In specific, they were asked, how can the church help you moving forward? In numerous cases, you stated their answers in the form of I need, I think, or simply help me, and by using other exclamatory statements such as the following. I need the church to keep me spiritually guided through stressful times. 
I need the church to continue to ground me so I can continue to do what's right. Help me keep in touch with God through prayer. I think the service can make me want to better myself, make me feel as though I can do more if I am closer to God. Help me have a better relationship with God. Help me by having or giving information about opportunities to work in the community to make money to support the family. Help me build my work ethic and help me find a job. Help me get my anger all out. Help me solve problems that I have. Help me make better choices. Give me great advice. Help me by being supportive, by giving me confidence and motivation. Encourage me to make the right choices. Encourage me to do my best in school. Be more hands-on. Be a place where I can express myself. Find ways to keep me involved in something worthwhile so I don't start doing wrong things. Give me a place to play. Have a church with a basketball court or playground so when church is done, we can hoop and play. Listen, just listen. Ask how you can help instead of always telling me what to do. Work with us more. Come to us and see our concerns. Create trust. Get real. Help with real life solutions. Help me understand why I should attend church. Persuade me about church and how important it is. As stated earlier, the preliminary data show that black teens who completed the survey are not at all anti-church. Indeed, their positive view about the church is affirmed by the yes answer of close to 98% of them to the question, would you say the church needs to be part of the lives of today's youth? 98% said yes. Hmm. At the same time, it is clear from data already presented and further advice to churches given by teens that there is need for change. The powerful messages that youth convey are many. Hear their voices again. Stop talking about us and start talking with us. Be approachable, be attentive, reach out to us, don't be lazy, stay in our lives. Churches need to be part of us because currently there's a lot of bad stuff happening to black youth. We feel like we have no one to go to. Don't accept no for an answer. We black youth need all the help we can get. Black lives matter. Don't be afraid to tell the truth. We black youth want you. I prefer they lay down the law and give us the shocking truth, letting the messages they give us sink in. Give us what we need to ground us. Invite everyone. Advertise more on social media in order to attract youth. It helps to feed us. <laughs> Keep trying and don't give up on us because some black youth are the way they are because people gave up on them. Inferred in the voices of the youth was their admission that they are, after all, adolescents, right in the middle of that period of experimenting with dependence versus independence, and struggling with a balance between the two. Resistance to adult direction is part of this struggle. What they're asking is for adults to be adults, responsible adults, accountable Christians. The teens are letting us know that the role of adults, the church, in Christian nurture is to claim the important role as present, reliable, caring, and truthful guides. Theologically, this role of the community of faith reflects the meaning of fulfilling the law of love shown in the person and ministry of Jesus Christ. 
It is what Archbishop Desmond Tutu calls Ubuntu, or what Anderson and Guernsey describe as the expression of co-humanity, in which the selfhood and wholeness of both youth and the whole faith community develops and is affirmed in intentional and continued relationship guided by the love of God in Jesus Christ. As people of African descent, we also know it in a proverbial sense. I am because you are, and because you are, I am. The question is, are there churches that are successfully demonstrating this expression of the Akan proverb, Ubuntu, or co-humanity? What models exist of this expression? I will close with brief reference to three models. The ethnographic work of research team member Sarah Farmer is now uncovering important paradigms of connecting churches with black youth. The importance of what she is discovering lies in the diversity of approaches in, youth by congreg in use by congregations that make clear one size need not and should not fit all. The three divergent paragrams pre paradigms presented here include one, the church inclusion model, two, the socio-political advocacy model, and three, the advocacy life accompaniment model. Although the primary emphasis in each model differs, there are some similar aspects that are apparent in all of them. The church inclusion model. This model is being carried out in a small town in Alabama. The black community was described by the leaders, a clergy couple, as a struggling community, economically disadvantaged with a preponderance of broken families youth who are both disconnected from church and school and at risk for connection with criminal activity and the juvenile justice system. Set in the middle of this community, the church embraced a mission of reaching the youth for the sake of forming a family of belonging and extending hope. The leaders reach out to youth through home visitations and the provision of transportation for both youth and parents to the church on-site feeding center youth meetings, and worship. Because of the interest of youth in artistic endeavors, such as dance, the church formed a liturgical dance group that continues to grow in size and frequently presents during morning worship. In recognition of youth's educational deficiencies, such as reading deficits, a part of youth group meetings is devoted to study halls with encouragement given to youth an invitation extended to youth to share grade reports. Youth establish rules of conduct and goals and ideas for relevant programming. The youth are the ones who establish the rules that are helpful in building self-confidence and leadership. And what they are doing is growing the group. The rules are voted upon by the youth presented to the leaders, and signed by the leaders and the parents. Opportunities abound for youth participation in worship and church life, from being liturgists, choir members, acolytes, greeters, and sometimes preachers, to assisting at the feeding site, as well as creating and distributing flyers at the train station, other churches, public housing, stores, and upcoming events. Because the youth typically do not have opportunities to go outside the town, the church organizes recreational and educational excursions. Making the model work required the leaders talking to people in the community to ask what is needed, talking to youth to get their input, holding a weekend retreat with church leaders to chart the way forward, but most of all, intentionally making both youth and children's ministry a primary focus of the church's agenda. The social political advocacy model. This model is the focus of a church-sponsored organization in an urban setting in West Virginia. The organization is called HOPE, Community Development Corporation, with the mission of empowering inner city residents through spiritual renewal, education, employment and training, 
economic development, and comprehensive holistic youth empowerment and development. Attention is given to mentoring youth, particularly at the alternative schools, offering sports camps during the summer, and working with juvenile offenders through efforts entitled Prevention, Intervention, Diversion for Juveniles, and Aftercare and Transitioning for Juveniles. The church owns properties for purposes of providing affordable housing and programming that focuses on drugs and substance abuse problems, the high rate of arrests of black youth, the numbers of fathers who are dead, parents who themselves have had children who were uh, crack babies and now require themselves nurturing supports. Efforts are also to reverse the effects of living in an area of former plantations where streets are named after slave holders. The pastor makes clear that preaching alone is not the answer. We have to be redirecting the youth. This leader's belief is that the church is not to be what it was. It has to be relevant now. No institution is more relevant than the church. He raises the question that must be answered. How do we respond? The advocacy life accompaniment model. This model is being implemented in a black urban area in Northern California. In this model, the church's connection to youth is designed in large part for youth at risk for violent behaviors and those already in the juvenile justice system. Based in the community, the model entails collaborative work with the police department and being assigned to young people, walking with them through court proceedings, mentoring them through periods in detention centers, and being available on the streets where a positive presence is needed. For this leader, this approach is the church in action in everyday life. It reflects an understanding of the church without walls. Of course, these models are part, only part, of our preliminary data collection process. And what is presented here from the youth is preliminary and stands as a baseline for looking at further data from an anticipated group of 300 more teens aged 13 to 18. Nonetheless, these preliminary data give the church and us reason for pause, an invitation to deep reflection, and a powerful, powerful challenge to reach out to teens in ways that result in their reaching back for responses to the real issues and needs they raise. Indeed, we must not fail. Thank you for listening. Give me hope. Can you take some questions? Yes, this is the uh, third time that Dr. Wimberly has blessed us by coming and sharing the youth ministry initiative presentation. And they have always been inspiring, convicting, and transformative. I think you can understand why we saved her for the last because we saved the 